Thank you to Christine and Mary Joy for inviting me to be a part of this day. Um, as Alan mentioned, my connections with the seminary and with the Eastern Synod are deep, and so it is really nice to see some faces that I recognize and to reconnect, even if it's just on Zoom. Um, and thank you also to the Dubrick family for supporting this learning event for the good of the church. It is important for me to acknowledge that I live and work on Treaty 7 land, which is the land of the Blackfoot, Kainai, Stony Nakoda, and Sutna Nations, as well as the land of Métis Region 3. I am committed to the 94 calls to action and to the ongoing process of decolonizing my own work and my life. My mother is from Japan, and my father was born in Germany, and I was born on Treaty 7 territory here in Calgary. My mother immigrated to Canada when she was in her 20s and pretty much learned to speak English after her arrival. My father immigrated to Canada as a displaced person from Germany when he was five, and also learned to speak English here, although as a child, not an adult like my mother. The language of my house growing up was English, as was the language of my church. As we would say, my mother tongue and my worship tongue were both English. Except that apparently it wasn't. It wasn't until I was an adult that I heard the story of my mother tongue. It turns out that from the moment I was born, my mother began speaking to me in her mother tongue, her mother's tongue in Japanese. She sang Japanese songs to me and spoke to me all those words that mothers speak to their babies in Japanese until I was three. And then, as the story goes, she stopped because I began speaking Japanese words to my English speaking babysitter who didn't understand me. And because at the time it was thought or she was told that children who grew up learning two languages simultaneously developed language delays. As I was the child of two immigrants, my parents wanted me to do well in school, and so the Japanese words in the mother tongue of my mother were muted. Only the English, foreign to her, remained. As an adult, the loss of my mother's mother tongue is a grief, both experienced and anticipate it. Apart from my mother, I am not connected to my family. I cannot research my ancestors in Japan because I cannot read kanji or speak with my extended family there. I fear that one day my mother, in her last days, might speak to me in the language of her childhood, in her mother's tongue and I will not be able to understand or to respond. This loss is also a haunting. When I hear Japanese, it is familiar, comfortable. It resonates in my bones, even though I have no idea what the words actually mean. I know a few words here and there, the phrase iko iko keiko-chan, which means something close to there there little keiko, is curled in my heart, although oddly when I remember it, it is in my father's voice. My children have Japanese names, tattooed in fact on my arm, because I cannot lay that language to rest. I know when I speak their names to other Japanese people, I do so with an accent as a Westerner. And yet I keep trying, hoping that some ancestral ghost will shape my tongue to say the vowels properly. 
hoping that my own accent will not serve to estrange me from those who are my people. And so when people ask me, what's your first language? I say English. It is after all my mother tongue. It's the language my mother ended up teaching me. My mother tongue was taught to me with an accent. The same is true for my worship tongue, for my God words. I learned now I lay me down to sleep at home from both my parents, one with a barely distinguishable German accent and one with the more accent to Japanese who themselves had to learn those words through translation. Now I lay me down to sleep, interpreting them into their mother tongues so as to understand and then translating them back into my mother tongue so I could. This was the case, especially for my mother, who learned her God words in what was distinctly not her mother tongue. She became Christian after she met my father, and so she learned her words for God in English from people that, to her, spoke with accents. The Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, the words of Luther's small catechism, all these words were taught to her by white others who were not her mother. To her, they were words spoken and heard with a foreign accent. But she worked hard at it, and she learned them, and they became her words. And for 50 years now, the language she has worshipped in, the language with which she talks to God, that she prays in, is English. And so they became my words, these words of faith, God, Jesus the Holy Spirit taught to me in my mother tongue by my mother in her not mother tongue. As someone who now speaks a good many God words, who teaches and preaches these words of God to others, I wonder how they are heard. Do others hear my words of God as if I speak with an accent? As if the way I speak is foreign, either because I am new to the place or because they are, because we all speak with accents, inherited from our mothers and absorbed from those around us. Each of us speaks with our own unique accent. Our accents can be comforting to some, a reminder of their parents and their parents' parents, but they can be alienating for others who must struggle to understand what we mean. I don't want to romanticize or fetishize accents, after all, to make the foreign exotic, because that is still form of othering the stranger. Accents can make understanding very difficult, both for the listener and for the speaker. When we know we are speaking with an accent, we have to constantly work so that we are not misunderstood. We have to find several words to replace the one that is unintelligible. We have to rearrange our sentences to give priority to the important words so that the listener might understand even if it sounds strange to us. To make oneself understood through an accent takes commitment. Which is why it is important to recognize that we each speak 
our God language, our worship language with accents. We each speak of God and to God with several accents taught to us by our ancestors, shaped by the communities we belong to. Our accents even change as we move from place to place. But threaded throughout is the shared accent of our humanity. You see, we do not speak God's mother tongue. Our words about God, our God language, our worship language is accented by our createdness, our earthiness, our humanness. God's language is foreign to us. God's words must be translated before we can truly understand them. In scripture, God usually sends an angel to do that interpretive work. The archangel Gabriel has their work cut out for them. Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know how to pray as we ought but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. We, in turn, offer our own humanly accented translations and interpretations of God's words to others. And so the question arises, how can we worship with words that we recognize are accented to one another and to God? How can we speak our worship language when we know that our words might be mistranslated, misinterpreted by others, or maybe even unintelligible to others? To begin, it helps to recognize what accents we speak with. More specifically, to learn what accents make it hard for others to understand as we communicate God's word. What accents make it hard for others to understand as we speak God's language. As I said before, we speak with as many accents as we are individuals, both inherited and picked up along the way. We may speak with accents of whiteness, of Germanness, or Scandinavianness. We speak with subtler accents, with accents of abledness, of Christian superiority. We speak with the accents of our genders and sexual orientations. And these human accents can make it difficult for others to understand our God words. Take, for example, the accent of whiteness. Our Christian language is deeply steeped in the contrast of light and dark. The first word God utters is light. Jesus is the light of the world. Joy comes in the morning as Psalm 30 says where the weeping is in the night, but joy comes in the morning as light breaks. Holden evening prayer, dear to so many of us, including myself, asks God that the light scatter the darkness. We pray that the light of Christ may make our darkness right. And yet, when we speak these words of dark and light with an accent of whiteness, with an accent of European or Scandinavian ancestry, these words are heard differently. Because our white accent takes light and equates it with good and takes darkness and equates it with sin and evil. And the good news that we think we are proclaiming that God lifts us out of despair, that God is the source of our joy, that Christ brings us through death to new life. 
these words with their white accents are heard as proclaiming that people with light skin are people of new life, people of good, people of God. Our words are heard as, the, as proclaiming that people with dark skin are people of death, people of sin, people not of God. And here's the thing that is difficult. It doesn't matter what we are intending to speak because our accents always come through. You see, when we speak about light and dark with white accents, with European and Scandinavian accents taught to us by our parents, our pastors, our teachers, and by their parents and pastors and teachers, we think we're simply saying light and dark. But for people whose parents and grandparents have been specifically told that their skin is too dark, for people whose not so distant ancestors were enslaved because their skin was dark, because that was not being made in the image of God, they can hear our inherited accents of racism. To people who have been told that fair skin is more desirable, that their dark skin is dirty, the words let your light scatter the darkness are heard very differently than we intend them. It doesn't matter what we mean to say, our accents come through. What we think we are saying is not what is being heard. We are meaning to point to the hope and joy and inspiration that Christ brings, we are meaning to convey that death is not the end, that despair is not totalizing, that our creator continues to create and that God's project of life giving is ongoing. But when the words, let your light scatter the darkness, is spoken in voices accented with whiteness, with generations of colonialist ancestry, what is heard is light people scattering the dark savages. What is heard is the history of the white civilization of Africa and indigenous North America. And of course, we could say that people need to listen more carefully, but we are the ones who proclaim the gospel with an accent. We are the ones who speak God's words through our own translations, our own interpretations, our own histories. We speak the names of the Bible's patriarchs and matriarchs, of Abraham and Sarah, of Isaac and Rebecca, of Jacob and Rachel and Leah with Christian accents, foreign to those who speak Hebrew and call them Avraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rivka, Yaakov, Rachel, Leah. We speak the words of the Lord's Prayer with accents. We can only guess what language it was originally pronounced in. The Apostles and Nicene creeds were not written in English, but translated and interpreted in oh so many ways. Luther's small catechism was not written in English, though we teach it that way. And even though we know this, it takes strangers to remind us of this because we no longer hear accents in the voices we have grown up with. It took my husband to point out that my parents have accents. I believe him, but I still don't hear them. There is an accent I speak with that weighs heavily on me because I know it gets in the way 
of certain people understanding me when I try to speak God's words of inclusion and welcome. I'm speaking with that accent right now, and I am guessing that most of you don't hear it because you speak with it too. Almost all Christians do, and I find especially Lutherans, although maybe that's because that's who I spend the most time with. And that is the accent of abledness. We speak the word and we hear the word. My accent is one of speaking and hearing abilities. I assume that when I talk about hearing my mother's words, and that when I talk about speaking words of God in worship, that you actually understand and can relate to me. I assume that you too have experienced hearing with your ears and speaking with your mouths. Open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. But this assumption, this accent of mine makes it often impossible for people with speaking and hearing disabilities to understand the gospel when I communicate it. Because when I say God speaks to us and we listen to that word and are transformed, people for whom hearing does not come easily or speaking must translate that metaphor, must interpret it all over again for themselves. And that's if they even comprehend it at all. For people for whom the sound waves hitting their tympanic membranes do not actually translate into meaningful concepts, whether for biomechanical or neurological reasons, I might as well be speaking ancient Sumerian or binary or hieroglyphs. For those we ones who have not yet learned their mother tongue, for those elders who have reached a point where they can no longer process any language at all, they cannot understand my words about the word. They are left behind when I proclaim that the word transforms the listener. And yet this accent is pervasive, especially in the Lutheran church. The hymn that defines us, a mighty fortress is our God, contains that line which stirs my heart, but which literally falls on deaf ears to others one little word subdues him. And as an aside, even to use the phrase falling on deaf ears as a metaphor for stubbornness or refusal to obey, refusal to listen, is one more way in which our accent of abledness gets in the way of communicating God's inclusiveness. In our liturgies, we elevate the spoken words, body of Christ given for you, blood of Christ shed for you, without noticing our accent of speaking and hearing. We proclaim that the Holy Spirit calls us forth. We teach our preachers to speak the word that transforms so that people can understand without recognizing that some people cannot actually hear those words. That these words are just sounds, if that. I can't even communicate this concept to you without my own accent of speaking and hearing abledness coming through. 
more painfully, we use phrases like the one I just mentioned, falling on deaf ears, or even turning a blind eye to describe when someone does not allow themselves to be moved by God. Our accents of abledness communicate that not hearing or not seeing the message of God is a choice that it is a moral failing of the recipient of that message. We don't stop to consider that perhaps the messenger is the one at fault. Because like all native speakers of any language, a phrase that really requires its own decolonial unpacking, we come to think that our accents are normal, should be normal for everyone. They come to be so normal that we think we don't have one. We are surprised when someone points it out. I didn't know that the way I pronounce house of God was different until I was in the States and my American East Coast seminary friends told me I was pronouncing it house of God. I didn't notice that the way I picked up pronouncing God when I was down there was different until I was back in Canada and my Canadian pastor colleagues told me I was pronouncing it God. Yet our call is to recognize and decenter our accents as normative when we speak God language. To decenter our way of pronouncing the name of God, our way of proclaiming the gospel as the way everyone should understand and imitate. Our call is to recognize that our mother tongue, our God tongue may not be the mother tongue and especially not the God tongue of those who hear us. Do stop insisting that it should be. I haven't listed all the accents with which we speak. There are many more, as many as there are languages in the world, I suspect. We speak with accents of gender, of Christian supersessionism, of sexual orientation, of family. We very often can't hear them ourselves and rely on others to point them out to us. I invite you to share the multiple accents you hear in yourself and your, in others in your small discussion groups after and even in the time remaining. But my intention this morning is not to create a list, but rather to point to the broader picture that we all speak with accents. Which is not to say that accents are a problem. As I hope you understand, I hear a German accent and it reminds me of my paternal grandparents. I hear a Japanese accent and it brings me back to my visits to Japan as a child where I had no idea what was being said, but I still felt surrounded by the love of my maternal grandparents. The point is not to speak without an accent, but to speak knowing that we all have one. The point is to engage in that work of being mindful that we speak the holy mother tongue, the divine language, the words of God with accents, to become comfortable with expressing ourselves as a second language speaker does, assuming 
that we will not always be immediately understood, that our meanings will need to be interpreted, working to find ways to say the same things using many different words, participating in the struggle to express God's love to the world. The point is also to have patience with the accents of others, to know that they too are struggling to speak God's words as God would, to remember that they might not hear their own accents, just as we don't hear ours, to be gracious in interpreting and translating and maybe even to learn new words for God as we do so. What accent would Jesus have if he were speaking in our midst? Whether he were speaking in English or German or Swedish, whether he were speaking in Mandarin or Tagalog or Siksika, you can be sure he would be speaking with an accent, something resembling that of a modern day Israeli or Palestinian. English was never his mother tongue. By the same token, the church has never spoken God's language, worship language, unaccented. Our spiritual ancestors, the Christians of the early church themselves spoke largely with accents. The very first Christians were almost exclusively Jewish followers of Jesus, who 40 years after his death and resurrection fled into the diaspora after the destruction of the second temple and the raising of Jerusalem, their mother tongue, their God tongue was Hebrew, not the language of the places they carried the gospel to. Paul, traveling to the church in Rome, in Thessalonica, in Corinth, spoke the words of Christ with an Israelite accent, with a Pharisaic accent. And even amidst all of this, I am reminded of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 14, that even as we speak in tongues, our words about God always need interpretation. Even as we speak in foreign divine languages, we need translation. We need others to translate for us. We need to translate for others. We need multiple words to take the place of just one. We need multiple speakers as on the day of Pentecost, each speaking with their own accents, what must have seemed like chaos, but was really Babel in reverse, a cloud of heavenly tongues speaking the language of God with human accents united in their difference. And where this leads me to in the end is that there is something about holy speech, about worship language that always needs translation, always needs interpretation. We never have, and we never will, until perhaps the eschaton, worship, with our words unaccented. Divine speech will always come to us and through us, through human tongues. But then again, perhaps it is the other way around. That human tongues, mother tongues, accented words are as holy as the tongues of the spirit. And that the accented word, when recognized as such, can be experienced, if only in part, as a word of welcome. 
So in the words of the Tsutuna people, which I definitely say with an accent, Sayuska'as. Thank you. Reference to worship language. Is that why some traditions have a sacred language for worship? For example, Hebrew in Judaism, Slavonic for Orthodox, Arabic in Islam, and so on. Yeah, that's a, a good question. I, I mean, I can't speak as to why other religions would have specific worship languages. I mean, you know, for a long time in the Roman Catholic Church, Latin was the official language. Um, and I do, you know, I do sort of wonder about how exclusive that gets. Um, my own experience with that, my husband and my children um, are Reformed Jewish, and so they go to synagogue and they do, in the Reformed synagogues, the prayers are a mix of English and Hebrew. And it's actually very few people who speak Hebrew um, just who know the vocabulary. And so prayers become something that are, um, are foreign, but there's also a sense of mystery, the sense of, of humility that we don't actually know what we're saying. And so approaching God in that way um, is, you know, we don't assume, we don't make the assumptions I think that we do when worship language is in our original language. Uh, but I think it's ambivalent. I think, you know, I, I think, you know, accents and language and all that stuff, there's an ambivalence that we struggle with, the positive and the negative. Um, we could use Luther's words of saint and sinner. Um, so it's not clear cut, but I, but I do think there's something about that. I, I do hesitate when we in the Lutheran church want to lift up certain languages <laughs> on an equal level as sacred. Um, having worshiped in many German parishes with my grandparents, that sometimes happens, but yeah, thanks. So you're thinking that the sacred language was originally adopted to create a unity universalism or whatever, but in time it has become for some exclusivistic because they don't understand the Hebrew or whatever. I remember, I remember as a child worshiping in Latin and you just learned snippets and you didn't know what you were saying. And I had a parishioner who came to me once and she said, do you have a copy of the small catechism? I did my confirmation in German and I don't know what I said. I did. So, so maybe what an attempt, I'm wondering now, listen to you, that it was maybe an attempt to create one common, whatever, one sacred place, but over time that that may come out in different ways. So thank you. We have different results. Yeah, there. There aren't any more questions, but I would also, given our discussion in our group, one of our uh, participants mentioned about um, uh, the, in spite of being sensitive, that was a term that was used around, and uh, in spite of being sensitive, there's always the danger of universal universalizing the white accent was. And so how do we? even if we are careful when this happens, what can we do about it? And, uh... my, my approach has always been with, when faced with the oneness of anything is to use a strategy of multiplicity. I think when we, when we um, you, know, you know, to be very practical in worship, when we encourage people to read scripture in whatever language they know that's not English, um, or when we even, you know, struggle with a pronunciation of another language, we don't have to get it perfect. It's sort of actually kind of self-centered to assume that we shouldn't do it until it's perfect. Um, and to encourage others to come in. I mean, this is, you know, at this very specific moment in time, you know, with Zoom, it is definitely possible to be inviting people to come in and read scripture for us in other languages. Um, you know, that'll be different when we go back to being in person, but I think it's always that multiplicity. It's, it's you know, in particularly, I think um, in Lutheran congregations, we have all these hymns now in our new hymnals from other languages, but we still hesitate to say them in those other languages because we're afraid of saying them wrong. Um, but we all speak wrong. And so rather than letting our fear get in the way of, you know, fear of looking foolish, fear of doing it wrong, you know, trusting the attempt to God and sort of saying, we're going to do our best. And, and, and if we get it wrong, we ask that you teach us to do it right. 
um, rather than sort of hesitating. And I think that's part of what I was sort of saying about the graciousness of interpreting for others and the graciousness of also um, accepting that others speak with accents and stumble and, and you know, to extend that graciousness to ourselves as well, that we always stumble. I mean, even, you know, the metaphor that I, not the metaphor, the, the turning to this, this language of, of speaking and hearing and the ways I use that it is just, I mean, it is a constant struggle. And I am constantly, constantly, my language is laden with all of these ability disability words, like the word stumble. When I say I stumble, I mean, that's a whole abledness metaphor in itself. That's that someone who stumbles when they walk, that it's wrong. Um, so, <laughs> but I can't not speak. I can't just sit here. So there's that constant humility and constant, um, recognition of my limits, which I think is, 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 is what we do as Christians. We recognize our limits all the time. Anyone else? Any questions for Keiko? Um, here's one from Laura. What about seeking opportunities to have people from other communities differently abled Cure communities and others take a leadership role in worship services. Yeah, I think that's really, um, I think that's really critical. You know, in everything, representation. You know, we say representation matters because it it does matter. Um, I think what I would say though is that, oh, sorry, my. Okay, sorry, y'all disappeared on me. Um, <laughs> I think that I would say that, that rather than seeking them from other communities is seek for the people in our own midst, build relationships within our own midst, because, because there are so many different accents that we have, you know, particularly around disabilities that aren't seen. People, pe you know, we all are speaking with accents. It's a matter of developing those relationships to find out what those accents are. Um, because I, 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 I think that they are already within our group within our communities. Um, and I say that because I don't want to get into sort of othering or fetishizing people who are different from us, you know, to go out and say, oh, you're so different. Well, you know, come and be with us and help us to be like, that's hard work um, for the person who is different. Um, I, I think at the heart of it is, is building those relationships with people. Um, I mean, that's always what it is, I guess. Yeah, and um, something that um, came to my mind during this um, your presentation was uh, also the whole aspect of we have different ac accents and different accents in, a, in their own way contribute to the larger whole and how can we be more sensitive to what is happening and uh, be sensitive to our, the accents that we hear around us. Yeah, and I think to recognize that when everybody speaks with the same accent, we're missing something. We're, we're clearly missing something because there are clearly other mother tongues that we are not hearing. There are other interpretations of, of, of God that we are not hearing, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, we and we can work to making that a reality in each of our own communities. Um, and we can also recognize that we then need other communities you know, we need other congregations, we need other churches. Um, I came um, to this presentation from a Lutheran World Federation meeting, and I, I just love those because we see how many other communities there are. I mean, it goes from sort of that micro God language to sort of seeing the macro of the entire world. And then, of course, you know, another, another accent that I didn't talk about because I didn't, you know, there's only so much time was this accent we have of, of anthropocentrism. You know, our, our, our Bible, our worship language is laden with the, the relationship between God and humanity at the center and not the relationship with God and creation and, and trees and animals and bacteria. <laughs> God bless them, viruses. Um, you know, we are, we are so, this accent of, of humanness is, is when we speak and to sort of, to, to recognize that. I think the first step is to recognize it and then, and then move to doing something. If you have a couple more questions, and uh, this one's from Laura McGregor. And how do we address 
Um, the fact that many may not be in our midst because our language slash traditions have alienated them. How do we address? It? Well, I'm I I think we address it by stating it first of all. You know, stating flat out that yeah, this is the reality, and that this is something that um, we want to repent of, that we want to change. Um, and recognizing that um, sometimes that hurt, sometimes we can't heal that hurt. Um, sometimes that's just the reality, and, and I think we don't we don't like to um, to accept that. We want to be agents of healing, but but sometimes we're not the ones who can who can do that. And from Mark Harris. Uh, yeah. George Lindbeck in The Nature of Doctrine argues that all religious traditions are sociolinguistic traditions. While I am totally in favor of decentering our own accents as normative, can anything be considered normative or authoritative when everyone is speaking with an accent? How does the whole religious enterprise need to be reconsidered if informed by such a perspective? Well, I think um, the answer to the first question is whether anything can be considered normative or authoritative, the answer is no. <laughs> and I think yeah. that's a good, that's the point, that's the good thing. That's what it means to decenter ourselves from, you know, from whatever we're engaging in. Um, and, and, and the opportunity that comes when we decenter ourselves in, in, in Christian worship is that then the new center becomes Christ, who was always the one who was supposed to be there in the first place. Um, you know, and, 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 and the question of how does the whole religious enterprise need to be reconsidered if informed by such a perspective? <laughs> I think, I, yeah, how much time do you have? <laughs> because all of it, all of it needs to, um, it needs to be, to be um, rethought. I mean, another, like yet another accent that 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 I didn't mention was this accent we have um, of cognition, of cognition and 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 knowledge and know the word. Um, we we are we are very much in our heads when we worship. Um, we are not very much in our bodies, um, you know. And along with that comes this idea that when we worship. Um, it's not so much now, right now on Zoom, which I think is awesome, but very much in person when we worship, our, our, our heads should be engaged and our bodies should be disciplined and still. And that is so um, exclusive to people who, who literally cannot sit still, like for whatever reason, because it's painful or because, you know, my youngest has ADHD and literally cannot sit still. Like it is, it is just, it is psychologically distressing to him to sit still in church. Um, and yet we, we use this language of the mind and knowing and the logos, which means the word again and rational acceptance and all of that stuff, um, which is just yet one more um, accent that we have that ends up um, that, that people have to interpret for themselves. And that, and that becomes hard work. That becomes a barrier for, for worshiping together. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the response, I think, is to learn new languages, right? I think um, to learn how to, the language of people who are more embodied. Um, I mean, yeah, it's especially those of us who, well, I won't speak for everybody. In my context, I pretty much speak only one language and that's kind of embarrassing. Um, you know, we are, we are very privileged when we don't have to struggle to learn another language. And so I think that's part of the work of the church is to, is to learn other languages, multiple languages, and to struggle in that and to see that as part of, as part of um, our vocation. Yeah, isn't that something that all of us go through, that where there is a do, do, very dominant accent that each of us speak in? And, uh, yeah. And the next question is from Christina Kunert. Which accents do you try to and intentionally pass on, Shia? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure. 
that we can intend to pass on accents at all. I, I've heard about, um, someone was telling me once they, I think they lived in, they themselves were from Britain and they came over to Canada and their kids grew up watching, it was like Peppa Pig or something, or I don't remember. Anyways, their kids picked up the language of the show they were watching on TV. And they would speak with that accent when in certain contexts. And I think actually people who grow up with lots of different languages know that there are certain, cert the accent will come out in certain contexts more than in other contexts, depending on the language. Like when my mother does speak, you know, in church, she doesn't have much of an accent because she learned to pronounce, literally pronounce Jesus from a, a pastor in Lethbridge. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's ones that we try to pass on. Um, I think they just, they get passed on depending on the, the, the communities we expose our, we are exposed to. Okay, thank you. And Pamela McNeil, when I've messed up and conversation contributes to a new language, is there a line between making that language mine or is it appropriation? Yeah, I think that's really important, particularly when we, we, when we look at using other hymns um, in worship and things like that. And, and um, you know, like I use the, the Tsutina word for thank you. Um, appropriation is about power. It's about, about, we appropriate something, I think when we take a word or a concept from another people without recognizing those people as people. Um, and I think, I think that's the danger when we when when we disembody the the hymn or the prayer from the group it came with and i think the way to avoid appropriation then is when we use these hymns is to say more to do to do our own research about you know in the elw we've got hymns from tanzania well what do we know about Tanzania? What do we know about the Lutheran church in Tanzania? What do we know about the person who wrote that? To bring that to life, to bring the person and the community with the word or the language or the hymn that we're using, rather than to just take that and lift it out and put it here. I mean, for example, um, the Tsutuna people that I, that I, li I live about 200 or 300 meters from Tsutuna nation, and, and they, um, they have, Canada's first uh, Costco on Indigenous land, and um, the fire hydrants in their parking lot are all lavender color, <laughs> and and so every you know I try to learn and to build so that when I just say the word Siyiskaas, it's not just a word. There's a whole people that that word is is representing. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? or I'll have to frame a question myself. Yeah, something that went through my mind even as I was listening to you and once again, thanks for the great presentation and um, was the whole notion of how do we take into consideration the notion of power and power structures when we talk of accents. It, when we look at racism, uh, if we generalized it, it's prejudice, but in this context, yeah, accents are there and accents of those in the margins. How do we take that into account? And uh, how do we prepare space for them to be heard, however they be marginalized? Yeah, no, I'm thinking, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. I wasn't frozen. I know it's hard to tell on Zoom. Um, You know, I, I think one of the ways which I am actually very bad at is to engage in church in speaking more slowly. Um, I speak really fast and I have to work to speak really slowly. And, and right now I'm teaching a class where I record all my videos all my lectures and half of my students, English is their second language. And the, the benefit for me of, of doing the recording and posting it on YouTube, and it's something that I remind my students is that they can actually slow down the speed 
and they can actually get automatic subtitles in and they can actually hit rewind so that if they don't understand, they can go back. Um, and I try to bring that into what I, you know, into my, my live speaking, whatever that is, by speaking more slowly. And I think when we give people space, then other people learn it's okay to take space to speak. That, that if I speak slowly, if I, if I hesitate, if I say the same thing with two different words, it creates that space in that culture where other people can speak slowly, can read our lectionary, knowing that they might mispronounce the words or, 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 or need to use a different word in place of what they don't understand. I mean, I think that's, for me, that's a very on the ground um, thing. It's, that's a less conceptual idea, but I, but I do think that's part of it. And I think, um, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the person who said, but inviting people to be the, the readers um, so that we hear all of these things. It's all about, you know, well, <laughs> it's not all about hearing, but it, <laughs> to, to, to do that, yeah. Yeah. And there's a comment from Hannah Kuhnert who says YouTube speed can also help with individuals who struggle with sustained attention because you can increase the speed as well to help maintain attention. Yeah, but that's, that's a difficulty, um, especially uh, those with accents speaking fast. And, um, but then especially with uh, live streaming and uh, telecasting and stuff, we are limited by time a lot of times. And if you want to cram in all that we want to say sometimes, because um, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? I mean, and that's, you know what, that's another accent we speak, we speak with, and even in the church, this efficiency language, it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's this whole economic accent that we speak with that we don't recognize, that we have to be efficient, that we have to begin and end on time, that we need to, you know, use as few words as possible to communicate what we mean. I mean, that's all, that's all a capitalist accent. <laughs> I would say an accent yes. difficulty with is silence. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Christine and Pat Patricia. Yeah. Um. Actually, it, it's interesting you talk about the efficiency of time and worship should not be more than an hour. Um, Luther actually wrote about that in his treatise on worship. He talked about everything a worship service should contain. And he said, all of this should last no more than an hour for we do not wish to wear out the patience of the saints. And it's not clear, does he mean the saints above or the saints gathered? <laughs> but anyway, I just thought that was kind of cute that he had he had said that. Um, and yet at the same time, I know others, I'm sure have been, have been other traditions and you, if you get lost in the moment and the time just takes care of itself. And I think, you know, part of, you know, again, another really practical thing that I think we can, we can do is, again, because of Zoom, we can attend worship in other places where, mm -hmm. you know, particularly for those of us who are worship leaders, it gives us that chance to decenter our own experiences and to take on that, that place of being a worshiper and to sort of see what that experience is like. What does that feel like? You know, when, when, when we attend worship in another country with another language, what, what does it feel like? What becomes familiar? what becomes strange and then to bring those back and say okay these elements might be familiar you know, whatever that might be it might be the order you know i was in i was in a worship service in ethiopia pre-covid and i didn't understand anything that they were saying but the flow of the service was familiar and i knew when they got to the lord's prayer i don't know how i knew but there was something all of a sudden about the cadence and so there are things you know i think when we immerse ourselves in these experiences that are foreign to us, we begin to see for ourselves, what is it? You know, maybe it's, maybe it is embodied. Maybe everyone stands at the same time and everyone sits at the same time and that's how you know what's going on. Um, but we can't do that if we continue to stay in our own experiences. 
And a com um, from Alan Jorgensen. What has COVID taught us about accents, especially with the turn to Zoom, et cetera? Have some accents been emphasized and others hushed? What might this mean when we return to churches, et cetera? I, th I think I would say we have, we, we strive for that accent of technological uh, performance. I think um, I, I worry when, when we get back into the congregations that, that all of a sudden the lights will be a bit too dim and the transitions from one speaker to the next will be a bit too slow and the music will be a bit too you know, out of sync or something. So I think there's, I think we're beginning to pick up an accent on Zoom or whatever on digital worship um, that we just need to be mindful of. Again, I'm not saying don't speak. I'm not saying don't use technological language, um, but just to be aware of, of that we are starting to pick up this particular accent in COVID. But at the same time, you know, I, I mean, I'm absolutely a fan of, of what we've been able to do in Zoom worship, um, particularly for those who have physical disabilities or, or other disabilities that have prevented them from going to church. I mean, one of the wonderful things about Zoom is now that everybody can use their headphones and they don't feel like the odd person out. Um, and that if you need to Zoom up the PowerPoint on the screen, you can make it bigger um, rather than, you know, I, I now need reading glasses rather than like holding it closer to your face um, and that if you have have people who cannot sit still that they can get up in the background and walk around so I think there's all kinds of ways that we're learning these things that we can bring with us um, but again it's ambiguous we have to think about it and Laura but perhaps we reconsider worship practices all together rather than offering accommodations to existing worship practices. Accommodations sometimes continue to assert our preferred accent rather than a loving others. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. You know, one of the things that I really um, loved in our opening worship was the way, um, was Candace's art, because that was a completely nonverbal way of proclaiming the gospel and proclaiming transformation into new life. And I just thought like, what, yeah, what if that was worship? An entire time of watching this art unfold before our eyes without speaking, without music. Yeah, 